Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, about uh, uh, five weeks ago, I asked, uh, asked uh, Mr. Rav uh, about uh, um, the arguments for the validity of the Ola Torah, and uh, Rav also uh, mentioned uh, the uh, reform movement. And I, I didn't uh, quite understood how uh, the, the reform within Judaism uh, fit in uh, within the argument of uh, uh, the validity of the Ola Torah. Gee, that's five weeks ago. I don't remember exactly what I said. I do know one comment that I, that I do make. Um, as far as my study of world religions is, you know, superficial, but I've read some. <coughs> the, the Judaism is the only world religion that has a reform movement. By a reform movement, I mean people who acknowledge where the religion came from, acknowledge what its original principles were, and have abandoned those principles. And in, uh, there have been lots of schisms in world religions, but each one claims to have the truth about what the original origin was. They don't say, we know what the origin was and we rebel against it. We know better. I think the attitude of, uh, of, the, of reform is, yeah, Moses didn't eat pigs, but we know we can eat pigs. Yeah, Moses didn't light fires on Sabbath, Sabbath, but we know it's okay to light fires on Sabbath. Moses was a beginner. You know, he started it, but we have science, we have philosophy, and we know better. No Christian says they know better than Jay. No, Ma, no Muslim says he knows better than Muhammad. No uh, uh, Buddhist says he can out-meditate Buddha. They don't do that. They, they disagree about what Buddha said, what he taught, what he meant, but they don't, they don't, they're not really reform. To reform means to change it, to give it a new form, to redo it in a way that's, that's different from the past. They all claim that they are the past. Each one of those other Shiites and Sunnis say that they are the real past, not that they're changing the past. So when you're talking about the... Um, the survival of a culture, no one pretends in any culture that every person in the culture is always faithful to the culture. If that were true, no, no culture would ever die. No, some people are apt to identify with the, with the original culture, and some go and do different things. Uh, sometimes they advertise it, sometimes they don't advertise it. So when you're talking about the survival of a culture, you don't you don't judge the breakdown of a culture on the grounds that there are reform movements. That's not a breakdown of the culture. That's a rebellion against the culture by some portion of the population, which is very natural. A breakdown of the culture is where you have actually one set of historical events, and at a certain time, different groups have a very different picture of those historical events. Different things were said, different things were meant, different principles were lived, people didn't live in the same way. I say you live this way, you say this way, that way, you know. In Christianity, you have two groups which have their holidays on different dates, not on the same days, you know. Um, so um, that's a breakdown of a culture. That is to say the culture, it's the contents of the culture have not survived because there are different groups who disagree about what those contents are. And so there's, and there's no way of determining you know, did the founder of Christianity present himself as God or not? That's a pretty big deal. That's not just, you know, do you wash your hands left hand first and right hand first. It's a pretty big deal. There are dozens of fundamental principles of that kind which different Christian groups disagree about. The sacraments. For a Catholic, if you don't do the sacraments, you're going to burn for hell forever. And for many Protestant groups, then you don't do them at all. You don't pay any attention to them. Those are big deals, you know. Compared to that, the differences of opinion that we have among the population that is faithful to the original tradition are trivial. So we have done a much better job of preserving our culture than the other compare. And the other groups are much bigger and much more powerful and much bigger populations, and uh, had fixed uh, countries and. And, and nationalities and governments to which stayed and go to go, uh, exile and so forth and so on. So I say that uh, naturalistically you would have expected the exact opposite. You would have expected our information to go to pieces 
and to get lost, and their information to be stable. And you have the exact opposite. So people ask me about the, what some people call the gypsies, the Romani peoples, right? So I did a little, a little research on it. Um, Romanis have no record of where they came from. They don't know what their origins are. Historians have some hypotheses, but they have no record of where they came from. Um, they have no common religion. They tend to take the religion of the country that they're living in. So there are various types of Christian Romanis, and there are Muslim Romanis in different, in different, different countries. Um, so if you think of your history and your religion as central features of your culture, they're lost. L-O-S-T, lost. They're gone. Uh, then there are fundamental differences about, about fundamental values. There are Romani groups which are against literacy. It's wrong to learn to read. And there are those who prize literacy. So much so that when I looked up on the Romani websites, they said, it's wrong to talk about Romani culture. You should talk about Romani cultures in the plural. There are many different cultures practiced by this group of Romanis. So what keeps them together? They marry one another. And there are certain physical characteristics that are, are similar. They have a common language. And they have a few common superstitions. That's all that's left of their culture. So if we, you may say, uh, over, and, and their, their history is 1,000 years, not 2,000 years. It's a thousand. The, the scholars say they came from northern India, probably as mercenaries in battles and so forth and so on, and uh, gradually spread and kept their um, social identity intact, but their culture went completely to pieces. So I think the Romanis are a very good example of what you should expect. You should expect that if people scatter over, over a 1,000 years, they're going to lose their culture. That's what's natural to happen. And that certainly is what did not happen with us. And that's why I say that our survival is a kind of unique phenomenon in world history. I have another question, I mean, uh, It's about the, the, uh, the, the level of ishtadlut uh, that one should make. So it, it comes from the, the concept that uh, we, we, we are not uh, determining the outcome. That's right. So the question is, so what... What, what's the level of Ishtarlut? Because one can, if, if one takes a certain ownership on the outcome, so it can make extraordinary, extraordinary uh, Ishtarlut. But if one knows that he uh, is not determining the outcome, so he should make, okay, so m the minimum or the, the average. So what kind of Ishtarlut he, sh he should make? Uh, if okay, it's a very good question. And the way that you start to attack the question, as you just did, is a symptom of a very natural uh, form of thinking which you have to learn to outgrow, and it's hard. It's hard, and you have to you, you're figuring out what we should do. I spoke about this last time. We have a book of rules. Don't figure it out. You're going to figure out. What, if, after all, if you're trying to figure out the right thing, you're trying to figure out what a good broker wants from you. He told us, "Don't try to figure it out." Don't just, you haven't got the information and the computing ability to figure out what his plans are and what his calculations are. So he has to tell you. And there are many essays written on the amount of hashtags that one has to do and what it depends upon. Rav Dessler has uh, a phenomenally uh, fu fundamental essay, not that the other ones aren't. This one I happen to know and I happen to have taught, called Bitachon Vishtadlut. And it's preceded by a, a, a mamar called Neis Viteva, which gives the deep philosophical background for it. Then he has five categories of people, and for each category there's a different way in which you have to look at what Ishtadlut is. We're probably in the third category where it's complicated and subtle. I'll tell you very briefly, but it, it's, it's a subtle business. <coughs> and um, there's, as I said, there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, of literature on it. Um, skipping the whole background and the whole framework, but there's, for most people, he says, the responsibility is to be a Baal Bitachon. Now, Bitachon has three dimensions of expression, and then it has an official definition. So Bitachon expresses itself in belief and in emotion and in action. 
The belief is that Kodesh Baruch was running the world. The emotion is not to be panicked over what you, of your, about your situation and the dangers and your responsibilities and so forth and so on, but to be confident. And the action is to choose the right amount of ishtadlus in order to maintain the bitachon. Now, given those three dimensions, intellectual, emotional, and, and practical, if I would ask for a definition of bitachon, I think naturally people would take one of two attitudes. Either bitachon is having all three dimensions. That's what, that's what, that's what it would be, because those are three dimensions in which it expresses itself. That would be a reasonable guess. The other reasonable guess would be to uh, have the intellectual belief, because if you really believe it, then the emotions will reflect your belief, and your actions will reflect both of them. Those are the two natural thoughts. And having said that, you understand right away that that's wrong. The, the definition of bitachon is emotional. It's a bit of a surprise. It's emotional. And uh, the Chobos of Lava says exactly the same thing. Others will say, will say a similar thing. It's the feeling of calm and tranquility and confidence. That's what you have to preserve. <coughs> so, the criterion for, for, for Ishtadlut is how will the Ishtadlut affect that feeling of calm and tranquility and confidence? Confidence that, that comes from, not from taking set, um, um, uh, oh, okay, uh, the medication that makes you relaxed. Um, uh, oh. yeah. Not that from taking medication, but the belief that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is running the world, that he has it under his control, that he's making it do what it needs to be done. One has to be confident and, and, and uh, calm and, and tranquil in one's acceptance of that belief. Not to be worried about it, not to be to be irritated by it. Just, just. so now the the tricky thing of Dessa's an, an analysis is this: that sometimes, in order to maintain that emotional bitachon, you have to minimize ishtadlut. And sometimes, in order to maintain that bitachon, you have to maximize ishtadlut. And it depends upon the circumstances. And it depends upon the circumstances in the following way. Let's imagine a person has a project. So now, either the project will succeed or it will fail. Now, first of all, we're going to work backwards, which is a little bit like a cheat, but we're going to work backwards, and then we'll come back and work forwards. Let's imagine a project that is going to succeed and ask, for a project that succeeds, how much ishtadlut should be done to maintain the confidence that a Kodesh Baruch was running the world? Well, what's the alternative? What's the enemy? The enemy is, like you said before, I'm running the world. I'm making it happen. I control the outcome. I'm creating the outcome. That's the enemy. And the question is, how much ishtadlut should I do in a project that succeeds? How much ishtadlut should I do in order to maintain my bitachon that he's running the world and I'm not running the world? And the answer is, as little as possible. Uh, but in, in, a, in, a, in a project with high probability of success... I, I said we're going backwards, right? I said we're going to start by going, knowing what the end is and work backwards, and then I'll work forwards again from the beginning. If the project succeeds, looking backwards, what will be the amount of ishtadlut that will preserve my bitachon that the Kodesh is running the world? The answer is, the less I do, the better. Because the more I do, the more convincing it is that I did it. Not only that, but if it's a success, I want to take credit for the success. So the more I do, the more likely it is that I did it, and the and happier I am to fool myself into thinking that I did it because it stokes my ego. So if the project is a success, then the less the status I do, the more protected my bitochon is. Now let's say the project is a failure. Okay. Here, it's, it's the opposite. Project is a failure. Um, I want to say that it's, it's, um, 
what I want, the idea is to be able to say, this is what a Kodesh Baruch Hu wanted for me. Right? The enemy here is, no, it's my fault. It's my fault that I failed. I didn't deserve to have it. So the more hashtadlut I do, the more I say, I did the right thing, I was responsible, I, I tried as much, as much as I can. If it still failed, it must be that the Kodesh Baruch Hu wanted it to fail. Not my fault. But if I did too little ishtadlut, then I'm lazy. I'm irresponsible. And when I say I'm lazy and I'm irresponsible, I'm saying I made it happen. So I've fallen into that trap again. So when it's a success, you, you want to have retroactively minimized ishtadlut. When it's a failure, you want to have maximized ishtadlut. So it's not a simple equation. Do as little ishtadlut as possible. It's not that simple equation. Depends upon what the outcome is going to be. Okay. Now, let's say that, given my psychology, um, there's a certain amount of ishtadlut which will protect me against uh, taking credit for success, and there's a certain amount of ishtadlut which will protect me from blaming myself. Right. So let's say, uh, first the hopeful case and then a realistic case. Let's say that if I do... Anything up to 60%, that's little enough. No, I got to do the other. Anything up to 40%, that's little enough to protect me from. Um, no, anything up to 60%, right. That'll protect me from, from taking responsibility. And then, I'm getting this. Let me think for a second. Yeah, here, you got to do it for the. For, you got to minimize it. So. One second. I have to work out the 60 and 40, so I get 50 in the middle, and I can use 50 for both. I want to say 50 is little enough, and yet it's enough to protect me. So that means that... Yeah, it goes the other way. Anything above... Anything below 60, anything below 60 will protect me from taking credit for, um, for, for, for success. And anything above 40 will protect me from, from blaming myself for failure. That would be wonderful. Then if I do 50, I'm protected both ways. But the truth is, it often works the opposite way. It, it's that in order to protect myself against taking credit, it's got to be below 40. In order to protect myself, we can blame myself, it's got to be above 60. And in between, I'm not guaranteed either way. <coughs> That's more normal. So there's no magic number, usually, for a person to say, oh, if I do that much, I'm protected against both, both outcomes. So then you have to have two, two considerations. One is, like you said, the probability of success and failure. And the other is, where is my psychological weakness greater? Am I more likely to take uh, uh, credit for successes or more likely to beat myself up for failures? And, and people are different in that respect. So there was one, Rabbi Shmuel Meisalant, Rabbi Dessa writes about him, whose whole ishtadus to support himself was to buy a lottery ticket. That's all. If he wins a lottery, it's not a miracle. Somebody's got to win, and he won, right? He's certainly not going to take, I made it happen. Right? And he's protected from that. And, and that he felt he could do and protect us. So obviously he felt he was in much greater danger of taking credit for a success than he was in blaming himself for a failure because most of the time you don't win the lottery and he's not going to beat himself up for it. There's a medrash that says this. It's an astonishing medrash. Again, this is all in Rav Dessa's essay. It says, King David... When he went after his enemies, he chased them, he caught them, and he killed them. The next king, I forget who, said, I can't do that. I can chase them, but I can't kill them. Because Baruch has to take care of them. The third king said, I can't, I can't even chase them. I'll stay at home, and I'll pray, because Baruch has to take care of them. 
And the fourth king said, I can't even pray. I go to sleep. I go to sleep. Because Baruch will take care of it. What were they saying? What were they competing over? What, were they, what was the subject? The subject was King David could do it all the way to the end and still have utmost confidence that the Kodesh Baruch Hu was behind it. Second one said, if I actually kill them, I'm going to be lost. I killed them. I destroyed them. I got rid of them. And that's me. And I won't be able to hold on to the idea that the Kodesh Baruch Hu does. I'll chase them. Next one said, if I chase them, they're running from me. I did that. I'm going to take credit for it. I'll sit, I'll sit home and pray. The other fourth one said, if I pray, because we heard my prayers, it's my prayers that did it, I'm going to take credit for it. I'm going to sleep, I'm not doing anything. They were all responsible because each one chose the amount of ishtadlus that would protect his bitachon. That's an illustration that you can see. It's a very rich essay. And then he says, this calculation of how much ishtadlus you do is very difficult. Ad kach that Moshe Rabbeinu failed. With the, with the Moragman. In the end, he shouldn't have sent the Moragman. Because Moshe said, I'm not telling you to do it. Do it on your own. He calculated where Klai Yisrael was and, where, and, where, and where they, what they were doing. And everything. He calculated it would be good for them, and it turned out to be bad for them. So I, you don't say, oh, well, if he failed, we're going to fail for sure because we're not he. Because Moshe won't give us the kind a test like his test, which will overwhelm us. But it's a test. And if Moshe Rabbeinu could fail, then we could easily fail also. So it's something which you have to take a great deal of care in trying to calculate. But this means that the idea of, Ish, of Ishtadlis is a very tricky, tricky um, um, uh, calculation. The Chavos Lavovos, I just happen to be learning Shara B'Tochon now, Chavos Lavovos says something that pe- people quote very often. You have a certain talent and you have a certain enjoyment in doing a certain profession. That's usually a, a, a sign that that's a profession that you should, that you should uh, 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 do. Uh, and, and you're not making it. So the question is, shall I switch? And uh, at least I say the default is to say, I'm talented at it, and I enjoy doing it. I did it in a responsible way. It's not fit, and that's what a coach wants from me. And if I switch, it's not going to be better, because this is where I belong. So I should stay here and... Keep working here, and then because Rohan wants the success to come, the success will come. Although it's not working at the moment, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. But there's there's more to this than, than, than that. I once went through a lot of sources on Bito. And many, many, like the Chosel Bobos, like uh, Avraham ben Arambam, the Rambam's son, wrote Sefer, must speak low to Hashem. And he has a whole section there on on Bitochon Ishtadlis, and he said, you're not allowed to rely on miracles, uh, which means you look at the world, and you see what you need, and you see what is done in a certain profession, and you, similar to what you said at the beginning, you, you, you do what is normal for that profession to have that, to have that, that outcome. Of course, if it isn't working, you try to analyze. Maybe, maybe you are doing something wrong. You, Forgot to read this book, or you had that misconception, or whatever it is. That's certainly appropriate to do. So but let's try harder. Right? So that depends. That depends upon what else it costs. Number one, and number two, if you try harder and then you succeed, and then you're going to take credit for it, then you shouldn't do it. Then you shouldn't do it. That's what the calculation is based on. At what point am I going to be able to let go of the results? The uh, uh, the Torah says, I mean, it, the desire to feel to, that you're a success, to take credit for what you have, is such an overwhelming desire. The Torah says you'll go into the land of Israel, you'll conquer the land of Israel, and you'll come to houses filled with everything that's good. And you'll say, Kochi, Otsugeri, Asa, Li, Es, Achayel, Chayel means property. Doesn't mean soldiering. Doesn't mean battles. It means making this property. But you know you didn't do it. You came in, it was already filmed there for you. Yeah, I did it. I did it. It's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible Yitzhahara. In a certain way, it goes back to the Chet of Adam uh, where he wanted to take credit for something. In his case, it was Ruchni. In our case, it's Gashmi. But we're replaying that, that spiritual dynamic of not taking credit for what you do. Uh, I'll tell you one more thing, and then I'm going to quit. I, I, maybe I'll go upstairs and talk about it. The, um, 
there's a there's a bitui which isn't exactly the way Chazals say it, but it's the way people say it. Pischuli pesrach kechudah shel nachat ani eftach lechem kevischo shel ulam. You've heard that? Okay, so um, I asked again Moshe Pindris. I asked, what, "What kind of game is this? I should open up the Ivan Needle, and Kodesh Baruch will open up the entranceway to a great hall. If I have to op- go through the entranceway to the hall, I can't go through the hall of the needle. Give me the strength to open up the entranceway to the hall. Why is he telling me I'll open up the needle, and then he'll he'll open up the rest? He said so that you won't fool yourself into thinking that you're." Your spiritual progress is your own product. We're talking about spirituality because Bible says, I'll show you it wasn't you because you know what you opened up. You opened up this and I opened up this so you won't be able to fool yourself. I'm protecting you from that. Wow, I thought, that's, that's something very deep. Baruchel sets it up so that you won't be able to make that mistake. I think there are ways that a Kosh Baruch Hu reveals these things to us. If you've got your ego in check and you're the right perspective, uh, you work on a problem. It can be any problem, mathematical problem, philosophical problem, problem in relationships, problem with your weight. doesn't mean there is. You're working on it. You're thinking about it. You're trying out different possibilities. It doesn't go. It doesn't go. You don't find the mafteach. You don't find the, the, the key. How to... How to how to deal with it. Now, here's a parting of the ways. I go through every mental resource that I have and I don't get an answer. What do I do now? Some people just give up, go do something else, and other people go back through all those ways again. Or a third time, or a fourth time. Why? You went through them all, they don't work. Because experience teaches me if I go back through it a fourth time, I get another fourth time, or the third time, or the sixth time. It happens. I don't know why it happens. I can't explain why it happens. So now, in English, you have this idea, the thought hit me. The light bulb goes on. You know? That's not trivial. That means I don't know where it came from. That's true. You don't know where it came from. So now, if you're a committed materialist and a committed atheist, you say, it came from the recesses of my subconscious. You don't know that. You're making it up because you want to protect yourself. If you look at the world the way we do, you say, Kosh Baruch Hu just wanted me to do that much effort to show me that it's not me, to prove to me that it's not me because I used the same resources that I did last time and the five before and the night before and it didn't work. So it's to recognize that it's a gift. So you can see that it's a gift. Right? So even, even the not really this person, even the general culture, it's, it's, it's recognized something that came, we say, out of the blue. All these expressions say the same thing. We don't know where it came from. So you can only protect yourself from the correct conclusion by pretending that you know how the psyche works and how the brain works and all the rest of that, which is such you know, nonsense. Is there a question for one more? Yeah. Uh, so in the uh, uh, Bereshit, is uh, uh, the Pasuk saying that uh, I hope I, I mean, like, so the list here is used plural for uh, Briata Adam. And uh, so. Well, but Salmo is not plural. I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm saying the, the, the Pasuk right. There's another Pasuk, Bit Salmenu, Kid Musenu. That's, that's yeah, plural. That's right. Yeah. So the question obviously, who is the uh, other entities involved? So the, there are Midrashim that say that he was, he's, I mean, he's talking there. He's talking to them and saying, "Bertalmenu kidnuseinu." So, yeah, the obvious uh, is malachim, right? So, and that would mean that there's some form or some. Well, tzelim is not a, is not is not picture. Uh, tzelim is some essential quality, says the Rambam in the first chapter of the guide. Um, and there's something there that's shared now. Um, but it means like the, the 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 plural there is going on the on the malachim. That's one possibility, and there's another possibility, and that's something called the royal we in language. When a king speaks, the king speaks in the plural, we. 
it's taken over by the European kings. And the, the, the royal decrees are not I, it's we. Um, we have it in, in, in a few places in, in, um, in the Chumash. Uh, when the brothers come back to Joseph and they had interacted with, uh, come back to, to, to Yaakov, and they had interacted with Joseph, not knowing it was Joseph, thinking that he was the second in command, you know, the viceroy of, of Egypt. It says, Diber uh, itano Adonai ha'ares kashos. Adonai ha'ares. Not Adon ha'ares, Adonai ha'ares. Because you speak that way about a king in, in uh, reverential terms or in, 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 in honorable terms because he's a king. So you, you refer to him in the plural instead of, instead of the singular. Ulai uchal nakebo. Like Asher in the arts says King of Moab to uh, Bilam. Maybe I can strike him and chase him out of there, but Nak is plural. We will. So the idea of a, of a we can, can just be the sign of Malchus. Right? So either you say that it's a royal we, or you say we're talking to the Malachim. But there is a consistency of, of a, a God speaking a, a, to himself as a we, like in, in, in the Chumash? No, but it doesn't have to be consistent. Why should it have to be consistent? Why would it be only one, one way? There are times when he uses that phraseology and sometimes when he, when he doesn't. I don't see why it would have to be uniform. Another question is... Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, the, the, we, see, we tend to say uh, Yeah. So, I understood that the Midrash said that there was... Like, my question is about how the, the speaking of, of Am Israel was made. Uh, whether, it could, and like I, I heard that uh, um, uh, he, he addressed other nations and they refused him. So in this case, <laughs> this is didn't, but no, it's a, mistake. It's, a it's a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. People hear this midrash; they don't. Uh, it's just just this very simple mistake. He said, "Because Rogo answered, offered the Torah to each of the nations of the world, and they all said no, and we said yes, right? But it wasn't singular." He offered it to all of them. And the goal was that they should all say yes. Not one out of all. They should all say yes. All of mankind should accept the, the Torah together and become one nation. And for us, it wasn't possible to say no because afterwards he held the mountain over their heads. Right? The Rav Rao says, if they already said yes, why did you hold the mountain over their heads? And the answer is because if they had only said yes, and that's why they had it, they, then you could imagine that had they said no, they wouldn't have had it. But they have to have it. It says, the days of creation, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi'i, Yom Chamishi, Yom Ha Shishi. Only, only Yom Shishi, Yesu Hei Lama, the Hei B'Sivan, Kol Abriah, Aita Tluya, Ba'omeret, Ad Hei B'Sivan, Shnat Kibanu, the Torah, as it's Lenu, because Sovel, But it wasn't in place of us. If the if the Moabim had said yes, we stop there and give it to them and not to us, ain't the way because they have a minute. That's something which people don't know about that midrash. Okay, I'm going to. You're very welcome.